and you know you can't change the climate so the only things you can affect that you can do to, to affect the quality of a coffee is picking and processing and so i'm like you already have three out of the five like and the two that you 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 can affect you can do it yourself like you can you can ask your pickers to pick well by paying them more they will do it mm. um, and it's it's a matter of education and encouragement and of course incentives Welcome to or welcome back to Coffee with April. My name is Patrick Rolf, and this is a conversation with some amazing professionals and entrepreneurs in the coffee industry. Sharing their perspective and experience, it's about integrity, quality, and the future. For this conversation, we met up with Nadine. Nadine is the founder of Primavera, previously Third Wave Coffee Source. They work with exporting some of the most amazing Guatemalan coffees you can find. And I personally have had the pleasure of visiting farms in Guatemala together with her. This is a truly unique insight in coffee farming in Guatemala. Awesome. So we're in London once again, uh, London Coffee Festival. So there's a lot of professionals in town. Uh, with me now is Nadine from former Third Wave Coffee Stores, now Primavera. I'm gonna let her explain about that whole, whole journey and trip of what that is. Um, basically, if any of you are interested in Guatemala coffee, this is the girl you should talk to, right? <laughs> so tell us, what is Primavera? So Primavera means spring, um, and Guatemala is known as the land of eternal spring. So we thought it would be a very good transition from our old name, and you know, it's been six years now, so we're doing a little bit of rebranding. Um, mm -hmm. So Primavera seemed to be a perfect fit for explaining Guatemalan coffees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rebranding is that because. Times are changing in terms of the, the coffee industry or is the, the, the company changing or what is the kind of main motivation for, for doing that? Well, the company has grown from from the early beginning, in the early stages. Um, and yeah, so it just seemed like the appropriate time to, to do a little bit of, you know, spring cleaning. Spring cleaning, that's a good thing. I think, that, I think that's a very important part. Like it's... I'm obviously a bit too uh, early in my whole process, but I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that as well at yeah. one point. Um, a lot of things have changed. Like we met, we met a couple of times before. Yeah. Uh, I was in Guatemala, yes. which was an amazing trip. I <laughs> uh, still remember that trip very well. Um, we met in Berlin during my time in 5e, you know, all of that. And basically when I first met you, you were basically running this whole thing by yourself. And you did that for a pretty long time as well, which is kind of impressive. Do you want to share just the whole, like, how did you get into this? What is the main motivation? What, what is your personal background? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Guatemala and my family have had a coffee farm for four generations. And obviously when you grow up in that, you, you don't want to do what your parents did. Mm. So immediately I was like, there's no way I'm going to be in coffee. So... I studied finance in London and then I worked at a hedge fund. Uh, I did have interest in coffee, but more, um, I was curious why so many of the coffee shops in London had specific farm names. Mm. And a lot of the places I'd known, like Finca La Perla, Las Nubes, mm. I'd known those farms from, from growing up. Yeah. Um, and so I was working in a, in a commodities fund and it was in 2011 when the coffee prices were at the highest they've ever mm. been. And I just remember my dad being so excited about the prices and I just didn't think it was sustainable and, and then the prices dropped. And then I realized that the only way that you could have stable prices for, for coffee was with quality. That was the only way you could justify. Mm. Um, and... It just seemed very inappropriate that people that had nothing to do with coffee were actually moving the price of coffee mm. 
just by betting on the stock market, mm. um, on the futures market. So it just seemed like the appropriate thing to do. And um, I started to get interested. I'd previously done an internship at Starbucks at the purchasing headquarters. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Uh-huh. That's when crazy. I was 19, so 10 years ago. Oh, wow. That was my first real job in, in coffee. Right. Um, I was a head at, at university, so I, I took a year off and went six months to, to Starbucks to work in every division that mm -hmm. they have, um, which is, is very interesting because it's a very structured company. Ah, they cool. cup everything. Yeah. They actually buy quite decent coffee. What they do yeah, at the sure. roasting is a different story, but... Uh, Fair enough, yeah. Um, so yeah, they do all of the logistics from there, yeah. uh, all of the purchases from there. Where, where, where is that? Is that from Seattle or from? No, in Lausanne, in Switzerland. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's super cool. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so you've been through Starbucks, which is obviously a good experience. Um, you saw the commodity side of things as well. How, like, where does the idea of the... Of, uh, especially come from like what how did you learn what quality coffee is and and how did you were you always interested in you know can coffee taste better or was that more uh, coming from a kind of a business perspective I, it definitely came from a business perspective okay, i cool. um after the hedge fund i worked at mercanta um yeah. just to make sure that it was it was a step in the right direction yeah. um and i was there for on just just short of a year okay. um, and then that's when I decided that I that I should move yeah. back um, to Guatemala yeah. and I was there for uh, one harvest the first harvest and it was so interesting um, and then coming back here and seeing full circle what the coffee was produced and um, how to process it and then mill it and ship it and then have it served in the in different cities in Europe that was very rewarding so from mm. that year um, I think it was it was a very good experience the first year so it went on like uh, from there yeah. yeah cool and it's been growing ever since we just feel interesting I think most of us have probably tried bottom your coffee I'm sure <laughs> yeah. uh, I've been working with them for years as well and they, they are truly um, they're truly amazing coffees and I think they've always been Guatemala is Correct me if, I, if I'm wrong or if you don't agree, but it's still an origin that a lot of people are, are maybe not working with, or at least aren't working with um, to the extent that they should. A lot of people, I feel, buy high volume, kind of medium grade, let's say, four coffees from Guatemala because mm -hmm. they're very good at producing high volumes mm -hmm. of that very consistently. But they're maybe not looking at Guatemala for the like, top lots, mm -hmm. right? No, I fully agree with that. And there's, I think there's a few reasons for that. And one of the main ones that we see is that most of the coffees that are very high scoring come from Ovetenango. Yeah. And it's a very remote region. And yeah. people that are used to just selling the coffee to the local coyote that pays, that is, that is mixing all the coffee mm. and pays the market price for it. And then mm. there's no incentive for, for people to pick or for them to keep the plantations um, at, at their optimum um, so that's where we saw a huge opportunity gap that, mm. that we wanted to take it, it's, as I said it's very remote, it takes 10 hours to get to most of the farms and, yeah. and horrible roads um, and it's taken us 5 years to get the trust from, from most people um, it's mm. Guatemala has quite a turbulent history with a civil war that lasted 36 years and yeah. still a lot of trust issues. Um, mm. So it's taken us a while to get people, you know, on board and and to understand that in order to produce quality coffee, they have to invest back into the farms, into their mills. Mm. Um, they have to pick properly. Mm. And the post-harvesting um, process is, is very, very important. Mm. How is how many how many farmers are like in general when you approach a farmer are they interested in doing the extra work that comes with specialty like are they, is this something they're excited about we hear continuously in, in other origins that the average age of a farmer gets higher and higher and higher and mm -hmm. there's really no young kids that wants to jump in and and do coffee farming is that something you feel in Guatemala as well 
Yeah, one of the major problems in Guatemala is actually immigration to the States. Okay. Of the yeah. younger of the younger generation, yeah. um, so we have a lot of cases where the producers are getting older, and then the kids they're abroad. Yeah. We're starting to see a lot of people coming back, mm. voluntary or involuntary, okay. but sure. they're they're back. Involuntary, is not mostly involuntary. Okay. Um, so they've been sent back, and they have no choice but to look at their parents for for work. As in, as in sent back, that they're not allowed to be in the states anymore. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're, we formed a, or we sponsored a cooperative this year. Mm -hmm. It used to be an association that became a, a formal cooperative this year of young people. So they're, they're from 24 to 35 year olds that are in coffee. Okay. So this is one of our, um, new projects and something that we're really excited about because um, we've managed to get the younger sort of generation interested in, in growing specialty coffee, not yeah. through the farming itself, mm. but through roasting and through processes. Okay. So, um, part of our team in Wawatanango is three young guys. They're yeah. all in, under 25. Um, and actually, Jose that works with us, um, he's the president of, of this organization. It has 27 members. Okay. Wow. Um, and he has a roastery. So I think their interest came from the roasting and from the tasting perspective, even though, okay. you know, it's quite limited, but um, mm -hmm. from that side. And then they got interested in methods and like, you know, every time I go to Weiwei, mm -hmm. they ask for a box of Chemex filters, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then... They, they, we have a small project with raised beds to make, to produce honeys and naturals and they visit, like, we have visitors almost every month to see what we're doing and it's, it's a novelty and I think the younger generation are getting interested in that, in coffee through that perspective mm. um, and just seeing that there is a future in coffee if they produce quality coffee. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. We, we should mention for the record as well that Nadine actually have, has some forestry of her own, basically, right? Yeah. <laughs> which, uh, which uh, I don't know, how, how's it going with that? What's the... It's, it's a very interesting thing. Like, there's a very, still very few origins where you can get like properly roasted, local, harvested coffee. It almost never happens, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a very exciting idea in general, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so last year, um, it started almost as a joke um, that we bought a workshops roaster, workshops roaster and yeah. um, shipped it to Guatemala and we opened La Central Coffee Roasters. Mm in Guatemala City. Um, it's been it's been super interesting. People really enjoy it. We've had really good feedback. Mm -hmm. um, there's some tricky parts to it because we don't have uh, parking and people in Guatemala City drive everywhere. Of so course. that's one of yeah, our downsides. Sure. So yeah. it's not as busy as I would like it to be, but um, we supply 10 different ro restaurants and, and oh, coffee shops. Cool. Um, yeah, and um, when people come in, they tend to buy a coffee to drink and then take a few bags of roasted mm. coffee home. Yeah, yeah, cool. So that's that's positive. Um, and this year we started, or we're part of an initiative in Guatemala City, or in, in all of Guatemala, with eight different coffee shops that are all specialty. Okay. So we took the idea from the disloyalty card that happened in London. Mm. a decade or more mm. ago yeah. um, and so you have to go to all the eight different coffee shops to get a free coffee oh, okay cool uh -huh. and people, people are into that like people people are getting more because we're, we're still um, you know we always overestimate how much the locals in an Norwegian country you know what their relationship with coffee is mm -hmm. we always think that everyone loves coffee just because they come from a coffee growing you know, country which is usually not the case no, I, Guatemalans drink a lot of coffee. Yeah. They tend to drink very weak filtered coffee oh, okay. um, with sugar. Yeah. Uh, we've started to change that. And then when people go out, they they want to have a milk based or an espresso based mm. drink. Mm. So that's always that's always interesting. And then you do get a few really interested people that are you know asking about varietals and processes yeah. and. Um, we we do classes um, when we're not in harvest. Um, so it's 
they, you know, we've had a lot of interest in the lab because the lab is attached to the roastery. So when mm. you're in the coffee shop, you see the roaster and you see the lab. And so we've actually had a lot of people approach us saying that they have coffee farms and bringing samples to us okay. through that, That's which really has cool. been, yeah, which has been interesting. Um, but yeah, it's certainly changing. Like people are very interested in it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I feel that that's the case as well with, with the roasters in Europe as well. Like we're getting more into Guatemalan coffees, mm. uh, I think. Thankfully, you know, based on <laughs> your company, um, which is kind of, you know, opening that door. And then for me, it's still like some, some really solid coffees, mm -hmm. like really, really good coffees. Um, but from a, from a farm perspective, what can, a, how does the process work? What can a farmer in, in Guatemala that you work with expect? From, from you or your company in that sense. Like, how does that work? In what sense? Not the whole, the whole process of, the, you know, I'm a farmer in, in Guatemala, I'll say I'm in Huevichinango, mm -hmm. and I want to, you know, I want to get in specialty. Uh, I want to start shipping my coffee out across the world. What are you guys um, doing with the farmers? Like, are you down to, because I remember when we, when I, when I visited, uh, you were basically touching on every single little detail mm -hmm. from, you know, uh, picking to uh, to drying to, to washing. Uh, is that something that you guys still do and how are you working with it? Yeah, even more. Um, so the first things that we look at when, when a farmer wants to join our supply chain is the altitude, the region, okay. and the varietals that they have pla already planted on the farm. Yeah. Um, because as I explained to a lot of producers, it's, it's you know, we, we had a, a very interesting meeting with um, about 27 producers that are in uh, Santa Ana La Montaña, which is a, another region that's very, very interesting. It's mm. really high, 1,800 meters. Mm. Um, they don't have water, so none of them have washing stations. Oh, wow. Um, they just sell the coffee in cherry to whoever drives by and at a very low price. Okay. So we came in and we're like, this is our proposal. Yeah. We'll pick well. Yeah. We'll pay much higher prices. Yeah. No, we can't do that. Like that's, that's just not going to be possible because we showed them the different, you know, we picked a few beans and showed yeah. them what we wanted. And mm. they're like, no, like we can't with our pickers. It's not. It's not going to work. Yeah. So we we really encourage for for that to to work, and we, mm. and the only way you, you do that is through monetary incentives. Yeah. And then it turned out that not only twenty seven, but it turned out that like more than forty producers um, delivered cherry to us this year. We have a mill that's about an hour away, so we actually sent a truck up every day to collect cherries. Okay. Um, so that was an interesting project that we started this year. Yeah. And as I explained to, to these producers, like take advantage of what you have because you're at a really good altitude. You mm. have good, good quality plants. Yeah. Um, you know, you're in a microclimate that is perfect for growing specialty coffee. Those three things are out of your control because it's mm. very difficult to change where you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, Planting new varietals, yes, but it takes, you know, at least seven years for the new crop. Um, and, you know, you can't change the climate. So the only things you can affect that you can do to, to affect the quality of a coffee is picking and processing. Mm. And so I'm like, you already have three out of the five. Like, mm. And the two that you, you, you can affect, you can do it yourself. Like, you can... You can ask your pickers to pick well by paying them more they will do it mm. um and it's it's a matter of education and encouragement and of course incentives you, you reference the uh, altitude and varietals that you're looking for a farmer to get do you have any examples and does that differ from different locations in guatemala or are you still looking for similar altitudes no because guatemala is very small so yeah. so it wouldn't like we're looking for 1600 and above and above yeah. And the highest uh, altitude would be the highest that we've found coffee at is two thousand one hundred meters. Okay. And what kind of varietals are you usually looking for or harvesting in Guatemala? The Bourbonas, Caturras, Catuays, mm -hmm. um, 
We found some good tiki seek. Tipica, but Tipica is hard to find these days. Yeah, sure. Um, hard to find anywhere. Really good, but hard to find. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, how is it in terms of um, like looking, talking with with uh, farmers around the world, or maybe groceries around the world? There's a lot of experimentations now with with new varietals or. You know, whether it be Geisha, SL28, or H1, like, you know, a lot of these kind of new funky stuff. Are, are you guys involved in that as well? And, and what is your perspective on, we have these new kind of categories of coffee that people refer to as, as competition coffees, right? uh-huh. which is basically crazy expensive coffees for whatever reason that most of the times maybe doesn't taste um, or has a taste quality that justifies the pricing. What are your kind of uh, opinions on that? We we encourage our producers to yeah. have different strategies for their farm. Okay. So back to the, the question that you previously asked, um, we support them with technical assistance. So yeah. we have two agronomers in Rovetenango that visit all of our producers on a regular mm-hmm. basis and suggest things because we can't tell them what to do we can only suggest Um, in terms of new varietals we we encourage people to experiment with for example geishas or whatever varietals they want to they want to have we actually provide them with the seeds Mm. if if they want that Um, however the strategy that we sort of recommend is three different uh, has three different aspects one is for them to be aware of specialty mm. and to know that not their entire crop is not going to be specialty. The mm. beginning and the end will yeah. always have, you know, it won't be as good as the middle part. Yeah. So the, the strategy that we propose to them is that they have specialty, mm. commercial, yeah. so the beginning and the end and you know sell it locally or to another exporter mm. um, and then to have either certification so if they have you know fair trade or rainforest or mm. something else just in case you know you never know what can go wrong with the weather or anything so they they can have those three strategies mm. um, and with with the new varietals and things like that of course we never recommend them to take everything out of the farm and, and start planting just geisha for example sure. um, it's it's tricky to say because for example geisha is a very bad producer yeah like it's the worst yielding coffee mm. tree yeah. ever um, and so unless you're at a very good altitude and have certified seeds then and have a guaranteed market for that coffee mm. then it won't make sense to plant that yeah so it's it's a it's a tricky combination between um yields prices and and sort of the sustainability of the farm yeah you mentioned um, just to go back a tiny bit which i know it's a touchy subject as well but when you uh counted up the, the certifications mm-hmm. you did not mention organic certification and i know that. <laughs> That's a, that's a very important question and um, it would be awesome to just get your perspective on that because I, I know a lot of roasters that are traveling around and they're basically just pointing, you know, make this organic, make this organic, make this organic, whatever that even is, whether, that, whether it's passive or active organic, doesn't really matter. But a lot of them are probably not understanding the bigger picture here, for mm-hmm. example. And I know Guatemala, for example, is an origin where organic is just not going to be on the table anytime soon for for several different reasons but could you just walk us through that sure um we don't encourage our producers to become organic yeah first of all the organic certification is very expensive sure um and then the risks are just too high yeah. with all especially with rust yeah um that being said, we also encourage our producers to have organic um, fertilizers. Yeah. So one of the main, and we we sort of tell everyone about this, and now mm. most of our producers have um, red African worms for their for their pulp. Okay. Um, so they make their own compost. Mm. So um, so you have two parts of that. One is the soil so you get fresh soil you mix it with soil and sand and then you can have a really good nursery Mm. 
and then the liquid that the or the pee of the worms um, mm. is really good for foliar so for the for the leaves of the coffee yep. as well as um, if you spray it around the floor of the plant it releases a lot of the bacteria that is stuck to the root system okay. and it allows the tree yeah. to absorb the minerals that are immediately available in the soil mm. so we're highly encouraging even though we're not encouraging them to be organic mm. we're trying to make them use less fertilizer less uh, chemical fertilizer and to blend it in with an organic type of fertilizer mm. so it's, it's, it's fair to say that it's simply not like financially sustainable to, to go down the organic path because the climate is too difficult to, to, to push that. No, it's so risky. Yeah. 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 On, kind of on that same subject, I feel more and more among my kind of grocery uh, colleagues around the world that we also have a tendency to go around and then suggest, you know, different processing styles and different ideas about, about stuff, which is, I know cases where that has been extremely devastating for a farmer mm -hmm. where, where, you know, European roasters not mentioning any name travels over and they say, okay, this season I want this process like this, I want this and this and this. The farmer would actually end up doing it and then the roaster would come back and would taste the coffees and they would say, I don't like any of these, I'm not going to pay for it. What's your opinion on... on I mean, it's a, it's a tricky situation because obviously a lot of the roasters uh, have been to many origins and can provide a lot of good insight. Yeah about processing yet at the same time like i don't see any producers coming over here and telling roasters what to do when mm. they roast yeah. um i think there can be a very good exchange of information and and ideas um if a, if a roaster comes and tells the producer what to do i think he sh they should be responsible enough to purchase the coffee that they ordered sure. yeah. um regardless of how it's tasting maybe if first experiment Definitely, a yeah. small amount would yeah, be a yeah. good idea um i know we've done a few experiments in our farms and mm. some of them have turned great and others have been really bad yeah. um but we don't do it with the producers like we do it in our own farm yeah so we take the risk mm. and i've pushed my dad to do certain things at the farm and and it's it's great um and we're we're able to take that risk that's yeah. the other thing like the producers have to be responsible for themselves and say okay we can take the risk we can do 10 bags of a natural mm. nothing's mm. gonna happen but if mm. your production is 20 bags or 50 bags that's a big percentage yeah no of course and it's uh, uh it comes down to responsibility in that sense right Which, yeah uh, we, we perhaps need more of uh more more direct and maybe more relevant so you guys are in london um obviously gonna do some cuppings i presume yeah yeah cool uh what are we what can we expect from the harvest this year in grandma like what are we um both like this harvest and also in general is, is coffee from guatemala becoming better what's happening like what's the status of guatemala coffee in, in general oh it's it's interesting because when i when i started in 2012-13 and that was the year that rust hit Guatemala yeah. very very hard mm. um, so every year has has been very different a few years ago we had a lot of rain during the harvest season which shouldn't happen mm. which meant that a lot of producers had a hard time drying the coffee because most sure. of the coffee sun dried yeah. in patios um, and so we saw that the coffees were aging quickly mm. and then last year we had a terrible drought Mm. which meant that um, a lot of the cherries dried on the tree because the tree didn't have enough water for them to go, to mature. Yeah. Um, so we got a lot of coffee, especially at the end of the harvest with a lot of Quakers, obviously that we had to, we had to reject. Mm. And then this year we're still seeing the effects of the drought from last year. So okay. a lot of our producers have uh, lower, lower harvests. By yeah. 30 40 percent is that could that be for, for example it's a, it's a similar situation in kenya this season but normally that indicates also um, a much much better harvest in terms of quality is that the same thing in guatemala or? i would say so i think um the harvest was also really late this year mm. um we had really cold weather in december and january yeah um and so we're only now this week we still received offer samples and people are still oh, yeah. picking okay. and, um so it's it's hard to say the the coffees are really fresh i yeah, think sure. they're they're much better than last year um mm. 
as I said, the, the quantities that producers have are, are lower than last year. Um, but what we're seeing for the new year is a really good preparation on the trees and we've already had good rains. Mm, mm. So I think next year is, is going to be better. And yeah. I don't know if a lot of people know, but coffee tends to be a biennial crop. Mm. So you're good or you're not so good. Yeah, sure. um, but yeah. How, do, how does that lower harvest translate to, because again, we're in Kenya, uh, for lack of a better alternative, what we at least like to think there is that, okay, so the farmer is producing less cherries. Uh, the quality and taste goes up. The farmer gets more money for those cherries mm -hmm. and everything kind of Bounce eats that. out. Is that actually true or is that just bullshit from, from a Guatemalan perspective? Like, is it, is it, will this mean that the farmers will have a very difficult year or can the quality of the coffee actually compensate for the, the lack of volume? The, the quality of the coffee, of course, gets a, a premium. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's getting, you know, it gets way above the market price. Yeah. But with yeah. the market price being so low, mm. I don't know if, if the price difference is going to make up for the 40% loss that yeah. most producers have. Yeah, for sure. So it's going to be a very tough... I trip. mean, it's certainly much better to produce specialty coffee because they will receive much higher prices sure. yeah. for their coffee. Um, even though they have lower yields in their farms, yeah. uh, it'd be much worse if it was, if it was a commercial coffee. Mm. Um, on, on a different note, so as I said, I just had uh, James Hoffman here and we discussed, or he discussed, or mentioned something interesting, uh, which we've kind of been touching on as well, because he's arguing that we're seeing a big gap in the market now because... Mm -hmm. We're traditionally kind of went from, you know, selling all of the coffee the same, not really separating, doing anything. And then now we're in a climate where most groceries goes in and we're hunting these really good micro lots, mm -hmm. right? Everything else we don't want to touch. Mm -hmm. And he sees an issue with the kind of in-between coffee, which is somewhere between, you know, I guess some people call it premium coffee or whatever you, you, you want to label it, right? But as in, it's not sustainable because we're not focusing enough on the full range of coffee. Is that something you would agree on? What happened to you? No, or? I think um, the beauty of the coffee industry from, from the production perspective is mm. that everything is sold. Yeah. We sell everything. We, even yeah. not the seconds. Yeah. Even the, the cherries that are yeah. still on the tree that we dry as naturals and yeah. sell for, of course, at a much lower price than, than anything else. But yeah. everything is sold. Okay. Um, and... And I, I understand his point, uh, but I think that can be very focused on very specialty London roasters. Yeah. Uh, we have a market for, for everything. Uh, most of our coffees that are in that range tend to go to New Zealand, for example. Okay. Um, but we've been having more and more requests from European roasters to have much bigger quantities yeah. of 84, 85, really good solid coffees yeah. um, for their espressos. Mm. Okay, amazing. Let's uh, let's move on a bit. We talked a lot about coffee. Uh, let's talk a bit about running a business, a bit about that kind of aspect of it, because okay. uh, you're a coffee person, but more importantly, perhaps you're an entrepreneur in that sense, right? So you did move in, decided to start a company. Uh, was that important for you to start a company, or was that, as you mentioned before, kind of a I saw the opportunity in the market and then I then I went for it. No, I think um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, really, yeah. and I think anyone that lives in a, in a, you know, in a producing country or in a less developed country will will understand that uh, in order to survive, you have to have you know a few different interests. Mm. Um, so my my grandfather, my my dad, and and his brothers have all been entrepreneurs in several mm. different. Um, businesses and so it, I think it was I think it's in me I don't know yeah. um my sister as well just started her own company so oh, nice. yeah so I think it's it's in it it's in the family genes no yeah. and now you've been like what's been the most difficult part of, of running a company right or just you know we're obviously a lot focusing on the on the green coffee side of things here but it's still you know getting the word out there getting people to know I don't know how much coffee you uh, you do these days I'm not sure if that's even relevant but 
has it been been challenging to turn it into a, a sustainable business or was that easy no no i mean everything you know everything that's worth it is hard i think anything that um Fair enough. that you're really passionate about will look hard maybe from an outsider's perspective yeah it's been a lot of hours a lot of hard work a lot of everything mm. but when you're passionate about something it doesn't feel like work it just feels like my life that's just True. that's how it is um but yeah it it grew we initially we started with an importing company based in the uk yeah. um and then a few years ago we opened the exporting company and mm. now we have an importing company in the u.s as well so it's um and we grew from just me to now 11 11 people so yeah it's it's fairly interesting especially because we do you know not only the importing side of things but then the exporting and the sourcing and mm. we go really deep into every single producer we have mm. four different warehouses we mill all of the coffee it's it's a lot of behind the scenes work mm. that unless you've been there doesn't necessarily translate yeah. um or most people don't fully understand or appreciate what's behind the green coffee that we sell sure Definitely. And now you're going into, so you're in a rebranding stage of your business, which is exciting. Uh, before we're going to talk about that, let's talk about, okay, you go from you being yourself to basically the company being 12 people. How much of that changed your kind of, uh, not everyday life, but, but your own position in the company? Like, do you still do the things you did 12 years ago or 10 years or the, where are you now in that sense, right? Have you, have that changed a lot? Yeah, I mean, when we first started, I used to roast everything. I used mm. to, we get all of our samples in parchment. So yeah. I used to dehaul and select yeah. and roast and wash the dishes and, mm. and all of that. And now, no, now we have, you know, um, Sainet, who's our lab manager in Guatemala, who's great. And mm. He fully takes care of the lab and all the samples and um, I used to do all of the exporting. Mm. Now we have a team of, of logistics. And, yeah. and same with, you know, with finances, because we're, um, this year we are representing around over a hundred different producers. So it's getting to be, um, you know, <laughs> quite it's a different kind of business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And now you just uh, very reasonably open up an office in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Yeah. What is the uh, what's the uh, the idea with that? Like, what do you hope that that brings to the to the business? Well, because I was based in the UK, I think our our UK um, market share is quite good, and I will continue coming here because I recently moved back to Guatemala because mm -hmm. it made more sense for the business, um, and yeah, no, I I really like the two people that. Um, we've hired they started working with us in in january mm. um and they're both from amsterdam so it just made sense to open an office an office in amsterdam um we hope to grow our european market a little bit more yeah of course and, and uh, the world championships in amsterdam this year is going to be a great opportunity uh -huh. well that was, that was lucky this should be launched before that as well let's, uh, let's see if we get to that um cool just to kind of <laughs> A different kind of uh, path again here, but from what I see, which is maybe not, maybe not true, but mm -hmm. what I see the same as in the grocery world is that I'm getting, you know, there's 10 new groceries starting every single week, basically. And the, the challenge there is something that I'm really interested in because I always worked under the assumption that, or when I started in April, it was important for me to buy from, from one supplier, right? So if I have one country, then I will buy from that uh, Export or import or farm or whatever mm -hmm. you call it, uh, continuously because I saw a lot more value in that. But mm -hmm. what I see when I look at a lot of other roasters when I do consultancy is that, okay, this season we're going to buy like two Guatemalan coffees here and then two Guatemalan coffees from someone mm -hmm. else over here. Uh, what's your kind of opinion about that? Because I'm trying to, I'm trying to argue that everyone should buy from this one supplier because it makes a lot of sense, both from quality and also financially. Mm -hmm. uh, still, some people, in still need convincing and I think it would be interesting to hear your input on that like why why should the people only buy Guatemalan copies from you rather than buying it from a lot of different people like what's the benefits from that no I think roasters should have um 
the more options you have, the better, no? Okay, that's interesting. Because, you know, you want to get your best, you the best coffee. From our perspective, mm -hmm. we really appreciate in roasters buy year after year the same coffee because it helps us with projections of purchases mm. for the new harvest yeah. and things like that. Um, but I understand when, you know, I, I, I highly appreciate um, the consistency and the support behind a more sustainable approach of buying the same coffee year on mm. year. Uh, of course, thinking about the quality and, and being okay mm. with, say, there is a bad year of, for a particular country or a particular region and then roasters sticking to that producer just because you know they're not going to drop them um just because it's 0.5 um mm. lower on the score chart so um but then the more options you have the better both for the producer and for the roaster because you know, for my producers, I have grown to, you know, they've become part of my family and, yeah. and a lot of them, we've gained so much trust from them and, and they, they really like and appreciate working with us. And, mm. um, of course, some of them have been approached by other, um, specialty experts yeah, sure. and things like that. And it's, it's really a free world. And in the end, we just want to be the best option for them. And, and if there's someone else that's better, that's wonderful for them. I mean, I, I don't own them. I don't own the roasters either. I don't, you mm -hmm. know, it's a free world and, and um, we want to support and and the whole point of us being there is to, in order for producers to get a better price, a better appreciation for the coffee and for the work that they do. And we always hope to be the, the the first one there and the one with the highest price and so and that's sort of um been the case with most of our most of our producers mm. some of them have have the the trust to tell us like oh no someone else came but i'm sticking with you and mm. um it that that trust took a while i mean it, it was interesting when I first approached most of these producers that they were like who's this young girl why is she want to buy like why does she want to buy her coffee like what yeah. the hell is this yeah. but now they like I think most of them see me as like a daughter like an yeah, adopted yeah, yeah, daughter yeah. <laughs> it's quite funny was that a, was that a challenge in the beginning as well to set that up like as being a young I can feel the the same kind of thing whereas age to some extent is a is a factor in terms of um you know, people taking you seriously in that sense and i think you going up against basically farmers that to be fair is a lot older than you as yeah. well was that, was that a challenge um i think so at the beginning is a challenge and especially in a in a country that you know is is quite macho and, and all sure. that um yeah. and when i first started i was like no i'm gonna do it on my own and blah 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 and I'm, i don't need any help from anyone and they just have to take it as it is but yeah. then I realized the smarter thing to do was when I was first introducing myself to a producer was always to bring my dad along mm. um, okay. just to, to build that trust and a lot of people know him because he was president of an cafe for three years mm. so he, he, if they haven't met him they've seen him on publications and sure. things like that yeah. so so they were always excited to see him and, yeah. and that was at the beginning and now um, now they, they, they see and you've no been around long enough yeah, yeah. Um, but then we do we do have some some producers that we've sort of stopped working with because it's not enjoyable because you know yeah. maybe they're a little bit too sexist and they don't so it's not an enjoyable process and yeah, I I don't true. I want this to be as I said it's my life so yeah. I want it to be as enjoyable as possible yeah, yeah. so um, whenever we go to where where we either stay in their houses or eat in there with them so it's it's less of a business and more of a of a lifestyle, like a coffee lifestyle. Mm. I think that's amazing, and I think that's a that's a pretty good note to wrap it up as well. We need uh, well, Nadine is food. She's been, <laughs> basically, she flew in this morning, and I forced her to do this podcast, which was very nice of you to come. Oh, thank you. Uh, where can uh, if anyone wants to buy Guatemalan coffee from you and doesn't already, how do they reach you guys? Where do you where do they find you? Um, well, our new website is primavera .coffee. Um, and we're actually launching a really cool video tonight Amazing. before the, before the um, 
before the coffee festival. You can reach us there or on Instagram or, you know, all of that. <laughs> Super cool. Thank you very much for being here. No, thank you, Patrick. From us here at April, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends, family, and colleagues. Thank you.